to introduce our first speaker. So when we came up with this idea for an IBS lecture, I scouted the ideas and my own personal wish list of who we'd best like to hear. And James Ferguson came out absolutely top for so very many of us. And I'm really delighted, personally delighted, and delighted on behalf of many people in IBS and elsewhere that he accepted. So James is the Heindel Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences and Professor in the Department of Anthropology at Stanford University. He's one of the foremost anthropologists of development and as such he's been an absolute inspiration to me and to many others going back to his seminal work, The Anti-Politics Machine, in 1994. But I think the point is that his work also speaks across many, many other disciplines and to a very wide range of theoretical and ethnographic issues, often focusing on Southern Africa, especially the Sutu, but also Zambia, South Africa, and Namibia, um, but has engaged those places with really big global debates, which have included the politics of development and its discourses, rural urban migration, changing topographies of property and of wealth, the way that space and place are constructed, urban culture in mining towns, um, experiences of modernity, the spatialization of states, the place of Africa in a real and imagined world order, and the theory and politics of ethnography. Running through so much of his work is a concern with how discourse is organized around concepts like development and modernity intersect with the lives of ordinary people in real places. And I think that's what shines through in a great deal of his work and what made it so relevant, I think, to the themes of this conference and indeed to what we stand for in IBS. James's most recent work um, has explored the quite surprising and remarkable creation or expansion of social welfare programs targeting the poor, anchored in schemes that directly transfer small amounts of cash to large numbers of low-income people, um, both in southern Africa and indeed across other parts of the global south. And on this topic, his latest book um, was published last year, Give a Man a Fish, Reflections on the New Politics of Distribution. And it's already becoming, I think, a seminal work, again, in this field. So what always strikes me about James's work is that combination of ethnographic depth with big picture issues and the way he's always able to be provocative. And I think we can expect nothing less this evening as James picks up the challenges of relating some of his current thinking, in some way anyway, though I don't know quite in what way, to our states, markets, and society themes, um, as he will speak to us in this lecture, not working around rethinking production and distribution in the jobless city. So James, over to you, and a very warm welcome. Well, thank you, Melissa, um, for that generous introduction. I want to congratulate the Institute on the 50-year anniversary and to say how honored I am to have been chosen uh, to give this lecture. I should begin by saying that my paper today, including its main title, is part of a joint project that I'm now undertaking with Tanya Lee at the University of Toronto. So, you should understand that the ideas and arguments that I will introduce here are not solely my own, but grow out of this collaboration. I should also note that as a way of getting started on this new project, I've spent the last few months reading recent ethnographic accounts that focus on urban people in a variety of world regions who lack what we normally think of as jobs and that explore such people's ingenious and various ways of scrounging living and livelihoods. I will also be referring to some of the arguments contained in the book that I published last year, which Melissa so kindly referred to, um, Give a Man a Fish. Today's talk then will reference my own research in Southern Africa, but also Tanya Lee's work in Indonesia, as well as a few recent exemplary ethnographies by anthropologists and others. I hope that this fairly broad range of material will help me to illustrate my central argument about the importance of processes of distribution in what I have come to think of 
as the jobless city. I will then draw some methodological conclusions about ethnography and the contribution it can make to development studies. Across the global south today, the city appears both as a rapidly expanding empirical reality and as an urgent problem, a problem that is both practical and conceptual. The very rapid growth of cities in the south is, of course, driven by massive, sustained migration of population from rural areas, as has been the case for a long time now. In the 20th century, analysts tended to see this migration process as driven by the process of urbanization and the massive labor needs that it entailed. The movement of people, in such a view, principally responded to an economic demand for workers. Today, things don't seem so clear. Migrants to urban areas are still coming in droves. But often this occurs in the absence of much available employment or even where surplus and un- and underutilized labor seems almost spectacularly superabundant. Rather than signing on as workers at factories, plants, and mines, as they might once have done, the new urbanites are more likely to become experts in hanging around and doing a bit of this and a bit of that. Often living in the auto-constructed shack communities that ring most of the great cities of the South, they find ways of getting by from day to day through the improvised livelihoods that we call, often without really knowing what we mean by it, informal. These livelihoods, ranging in their dazzling profusion from urban foraging to petty commodity production, from salvage work to sex work, from smuggling to hawking and other micro-retail trade, these take the place of the formal sector, industrial, wage labor, or salaried state posts that many were led to expect. <coughs> this state of affairs is evidently the source of deep dissatisfaction for many. As diverse as the circumstances and ambitions of the new <coughs> urban denizens may be, there is one bitter complaint that seems to come up again and again. There are, they say, no jobs. Analysts seeking to capture this, seek to capture this reality by deploying a range of usually ill-defined terms, ranging from precarious or un- and underemployed to informal or lumpen, or sometimes simply the youth, though the fact that some of those so designated are nearly my age ought perhaps to give us some pause here. But whatever the terminology, it is clear that the contemporary global city is full of people who are, as my title today has it, not working. Not engaged, that is, in that much mythologized, stable, waged employment that has long been taken to constitute a proper job. As I will emphasize, this does not imply that such people are idle. I will soon argue just the opposite. But however hard they may in fact be working, they understand themselves to lack that prized and scarce possession called a job, or sometimes a real job. It is in this quite particular sense that I speak of the jobless city. My understanding of these issues is shaped by my long ethnographic experience in Southern Africa where recent years have seen a dramatic erosion of the availability of wage employment. Here, where wage labor was always, first of all, a male domain, a new generation of male youth has been thrust, bewildered, into a world where few jobs await them, and where they have little prospect of obtaining the sorts of stable wage labor-based livelihoods that their fathers and grandfathers prized. For many, this has meant that coming of age is no longer associated with the opportunity to secure an independent economic livelihood, or indeed, to marry, to establish legitimate households, and in a real sense, to ascend to social adulthood. Not for nothing do we think of them as the youth. 
With low-skilled manual labor, finding few takers in the job market, their labor power does not easily translate into livelihoods. And more and more of the rising generation, in fact, manage to live only by depending on family members and others. Poor communities and neighborhoods that were formerly supported by wage labor and the remittances that it enabled, meanwhile, are now keeping it together through a different kind of dependence. In South Africa, and to a lesser extent several other countries in the region, state transfers paid to the elderly, the disabled, and those caring for children are a central pillar of daily life. In South Africa, some 42% of all households received some sort of monthly direct social payment from the state. As access to wage labor has steadily diminished, the dissemination of what are in South Africa called social grants, and in the development world called cash transfers, has created new sources of livelihood, not directly linked to productive labor, and in the process given new centrality to processes of distribution. The shrinking role of wage labor presents itself as a problem of policy, of course. But I would also like us to consider it here as a problem of thought and a problem of social analysis. The sense of lacking jobs, which I suggested is widely shared among new urban masses across the global south, is perhaps most acute in places like South Africa that once had such jobs. Here, the contemporary reality of what Michael Denning has called wageless life is experienced as a kind of fall from grace, the tragic end of a remembered and often idealized world where men had both jobs and the social power that came from those jobs. In the labor-scarce political economy of the apartheid migrant labor system, unskilled male labor, however badly treated, was in demand. Indeed, the contemporary observer cannot help but be shocked by how ready some of today's South Africans are to forget or to downplay the appalling exploitation and abuse of the old apartheid labor regime, as the bad old days of the old migrant labor system are today often refigured as the objects of an unlikely nostalgia. In other places, and certainly in most of Africa, Wage labor never acquired such a dominant place. Yet strangely, it is sometimes mourned in its absence nearly as acutely. Joblessness in these cases appears not so much as a break with the past, but as a rupture with the future, in that the aspiring masses who have left rural life for the city in recent decades are not finding there the employment-based modern consumer life that vernacular expectations of modernity, to use an old phrase, had led them to expect. Instead, they inhabit a kind of limbo, as Craig Jeffrey has put it, a limbo of waiting, hustling, and hanging out that is understood in opposition to the real job, the job that one ought in a proper world to have. For those in such circumstances, Urban life involves less the glamour and glory of modernity than the disappointment and humiliation of not working. But the vast and expanding cities of the global south are also the sites of grand narratives purporting to explain the lives that unfold within them. And if the inhabitants of such cities are only too often not working, we must observe that the same can be said of these narratives, for they, too, are not working. I have in mind particularly two such big stories that have been especially important in shaping a kind of scholarly common sense about the jobless city. <coughs> the first of these narratives I refer to as the transition narrative. It tells the story of the movement of people from rural to urban life as part of a great systemic transformation in which traditional agriculture gives way to modern industry and peasants become wage laborers. The more mainstream version of the story has generally told the tale 
as an essentially benevolent process of industrial growth, urbanization, and expanded prosperity. Left versions of the story have generally emphasized instead an exploitative process of capital accumulation and class conflict. But neither version anticipated the emergence and amazing growth of new urban classes who have neither viable connections to land, they are no longer peasants, nor access to wage labor, they cannot become in that sense workers. And neither version seems up to the task of accounting for these new urban masses and analyzing the meaning. Yet as Tanya Lee has pointed out, the old transition stories still shape the visions of major development agencies. Recent World Bank reports on agrarian transition, she shows, document the massive current and likely future shedding of labor from smallholder agriculture in Indonesia, but then simply assume that these surplus populations, as Lee terms them, will somehow automatically be absorbed into expanding labor markets. This, she points out, is the transition model, where employment more or less smoothly shifts from traditional agriculture to modern industry. But it is highly implausible in a context where new industrial employment is simply unavailable on anything like the scale that would be required. The Marxist alternative, generally presented as at the opposite pole from such bourgeois social science, as we used to say, gives the story a different political spin. But in fact, it offers a remarkably similar account. Those displaced from peasant and subsistence agriculture are presumed to be, in the long arc of history, swept up in a process of proletarianization, destined to transform them into an industrial working class, though perhaps in a functionalist touch, with just enough of a residual reserve army of unemployed to keep the working class in line. The end point of the transition, in both the left and the right versions of the transition story, was supposed to be a world of more or less generalized wage labor. Indeed, a world in which wage labor provided most people's basic livelihood most of the time was imagined as the universal destination of modern societies by Western social theorists throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. A developed society in this conception was an industrialized society, a society fundamentally composed of families, each of which was anchored by an employed breadwinner worker, generally presumed to be male, and understood to be organically linked with a range of so-called dependents, such as wives and children. In this idealized picture, it would only be exceptions to the wage laboring norm brought about by accident, disability, old age, or cyclical economic downturns that would require such distributed state interventions as welfare, pensions, and unemployment insurance. In the normal course of things, the able-bodied man, the very phrase is redolent at the times I've been evoking here, the able-bodied man would be provisioned through wage labor. This was never, of course, more than a highly schematic and idealized picture. And it must be remembered that such a social order was never, in fact, fully achieved, even in the heart of the so-called developed world, and even in the heyday of the so-called full employment welfare states. But it was an image of a social future that was widely embraced and anticipated as a kind of telos of the development process across a remarkable range of empirical sites. Today, though, this figure of the head of household with the so-called proper job looks less like an inevitable and un universal future than a kind of temporary aberration or anachronistic fantasy. Not only was stable, formal sector wage employment nowhere truly universalized, in much of the world, and certainly in that part of it that we now call post-colonial, <coughs> It was seldom more than a privilege enjoyed by a small minority, a pipe dream or a rumor for everyone else. <clears throat> 
Today, it is increasingly impossible to ignore that it is those hard to categorize other sorts of livelihood that often loom larger than the long anticipated formal sector industrial wage labor or salaried state <coughs> posts, the so called real jobs. Such improvised ways of making a living were invisible or marginal to the great 20th century industrial progress stories. But today, there's no ignoring that they are now how a great many people in the world, in fact, aspire. The social sciences, which are themselves products of that era that Guy Standing once called the century of the laboring man, the social sciences are having a hard time adjusting. And our common sense habits of thought too often tend to fall into the ruts of an old story that we ought to and in our more critical moods and moments do know enough to mistrust. Too often we still speak as if the development process will somehow by itself produce jobs for all, as if it is somehow just a matter of waiting. In the meantime, the improvisers of the jobless city, who know better, are getting on with their business. Maybe it's time for us to get on with our business too. Perhaps that is, it's time to stop thinking of improvised livelihoods as marginal or peripheral or transitional. In fact, we might even need to start thinking of them as the developmental main line, in that it is the improvised alternatives and not the so-called real jobs that, in much of the world at least, support most people most of the time, and that seem likely to continue to do so for a long time to come. The second narrative I have in mind is perhaps equally pervasive today and equally unhelpful. This I think of as the catastrophe narrative. Here, the central dynamic is not the progressive emergence of an expansive industrial economy, but the destruction of once stable societies by the corrosive force of what is called things like unfettered market capitalism or neoliberalism. The result is a degraded planet of slums, disorderly cities full of abandoned and abused victims whose wasted lives are the collateral damage of neoliberalism's savage free markets. I skip, will skip over this part of the paper for reasons of time, but you will know who I'm talking about. People like Mike Davis and Zygmunt Bauman specifically, but I also mean to evoke more broadly the strangely nostalgic, negative, and reactive mood of so many on the left today. In the full paper, I identify a number of analytical and political problems with the catastrophe narrative. But the most important one, for my purposes, is simply that it is able to recognize the new urban improvisers I'm concerned with here only as passive victims or symptoms of structural violence and societal decay. In fact, while the catastrophe narrative implies a different sort of outcome than the transition story, I suggest that these two tired narratives have more in common than their proponents would care to admit. And they are both, as I suggested at the start, not working when it comes to making sense of the new urban masses populating the explosively expanding cities of the global south. What we need instead is a better story, or maybe a few. To develop these alternative accounts, we have some work to do, hammering out new analytic categories and concepts that will be a better guide to the actual empirical realities we seek to grasp. But I emphasize that this is not just a matter of finding fashionable new language or snappy new buzzwords. Developing new concepts and categories will only matter if we can put them to work to produce both new empirical research and eventually new political strategies or policies. This analytical and conceptual work is a long and collaborative task, and it has been going on for some time. Indeed, all of us who have been in various different ways 
dissatisfied with those old narratives, have been working in large ways and small to find such alternatives. In that spirit, and without claiming any special novelty for them, let me offer a few suggestions for analytic reorientation that come from my own recent book, Give a Man a Fish. I will then try to illustrate some of the directions that they may take us by referring both to my own work and to some of that recent ethnography from which, as I noted, I have recently taken inspiration. Let me begin by introducing a key concept that I develop in the book, what I call distributive labor. Many urban livelihood strategies, I observe, do not involve producing much of anything, but instead finding ways to make effective claims of the incomes and resources of others. And this social achievement, that is, working oneself into the position of being able to make such effective distributive claims, does not come easily. Normally, it involves long, hard work, a kind of labor. Now, I don't claim that such distributed labor is all that is going on here, or that improvised urban livelihoods are not very often involved in a range of productive activities as well. They surely are. But we have been too quick, I suggest, to couple labor with production. A persistent productionist bias has distorted our understanding of what labor is and why it matters. Close attention to actual livelihoods in the jobless city reveals that they sometimes have remarkably little to do with production and instead turn on gaining access to streams or sources of income held by others. Indeed, one of the great attractions of the city, even for those whose labor is not in demand, is that it provides a spatial and sometimes social proximity to resources resources that one may, with some ingenuity, find ways to access directly or indirectly. Scavenging, borrowing, hitting up a wealthy cousin, finding a lover who gives one gifts, moving in with that uncle with a spare room, attaching oneself to a local politician or patron, finding a hustle, working a scam. These are all ways of accessing or appropriating rather than producing goods. <coughs> but they all also involve a real and non-trivial kind of labor, a kind of labor that has less to do with joining in a production process than with managing and cultivating a complex network of social relationships and dependencies. In fact, an ethnographic view reveals that being unemployed in the jobless city typically involves a more or less continuous sort of distributive labor. People, in fact, work quite hard at what I call not working. And the results of this labor are both real and extremely significant. Indeed, it is not too much to say that huge populations are only able to stay alive through such, as I term it, distributive labor. I therefore argue that we need both to better attend to such labor analytically and to better value it politically. We have tended to ignore and disparage such labor, I argue in the book, because of a deeply rooted and profoundly gendered prejudice against social dependence in general and the fundamentally distributive livelihood strategies rooted in such dependence. A kind of productivist bias has led us to suppose that it is somehow only productive labor that really matters. Most of all, the labor of that idealized breadwinner figure, the male industrial productive worker, the real worker with the real job. In fact, as Anand Singh has recently observed, many kinds of livelihoods that are neither industrial nor agricultural from foraging to collecting to stealing, persist and even proliferate today. Yet we tend to neglect them because they are not part of what she calls the industrial progress story. <coughs> industrial employment especially figures as a kind of pinnacle of economic development. 
And all the other ways that people, in fact, sustain themselves are subtly marginalized, even though they are how much of the world, in fact, lives. <laughs> Neoclassical economists may still be waiting for the wonders of the free market to produce that robust growth that will yield full employment. And die-hard Marxist theorists may still be waiting for the proletariat and the revolution. But ordinary people, in the meantime, are working out their own solutions, often in ways that have little to do with productivist ideas about real jobs and industrial revolutions. There is more, too, to this mundane vernacular working out than simply the pragmatics of livelihood. There is also a distinctive form of politics. As I suggest in the book, this is neither the representative citizen-based rights claims of liberal political theory, nor the horizontal class-based solidarity of Marxism. Instead, it is a politics in which processes of distribution are central, as are the relationships through which effective distributive claims can be pursued. It is therefore often personalistic or clientelistic in character, and sometimes disconcerts us by speaking in idioms of inequality rather than equality, and asserting responsibilities more than rights, dependence more than independence. This kind of politics is sometimes dismissed as an anachronistic relic of the past, traditional paternalism or what have you, but my claim is that it is very much of the present. Indeed, with more and more people not working, at least in many cities around the world, it may not be too much to say that such a politics of distribution is the politics of the future. So I take from the book the argument that we need to pay more attention both to distributive labor and the livelihoods it supports, and to the way that distributive claims, including claims to direct distribution from the state, <coughs> are opening up onto an emergent new politics of distribution. To be properly convinced of this, or even properly unconvinced, I suppose, you would really need to read the book. But with the argument now at least stated, if not substantiated, I would like to take the rest of my time to sketch a few ways that the world of the not working is being approached through empirical research in my own field of anthropology and to make a few suggestions about what relevance this may have for the interdisciplinary and problem-oriented field of development studies. I will give two examples. First, some recent research approaches to livelihood strategies focused on informal social forms of distribution. And second, a set of questions about the increasingly important programs of state-run direct distribution via cash transfers. Making sense of distribution-based livelihoods is a task to which anthropology, with its holistic and ethnographic approach, is especially well-suited. While industrial wage laborers were imagined, if sometimes misleadingly, as having an economic existence as workers that was in some sense separable from their intimate private lives, the distributed livelihoods I'm concerned with promiscuously transgress both the public domestic divide and the separation of labor and person that is at the heart of the wage labor contract. Instead, the pursuit of distributed livelihoods inevitably involves the whole person, and with it, the dense interweaving of social relationships by which such a person is constituted. Jennifer Cole's compelling ethnography of the young women of a Madagascar port town, a book called Sex and Salvation, offers a vivid illustration of this. In a social world where stable, formal sector jobs are now only a memory left over from colonial and socialist eras, little attractive employment is available for either sex, meaning that young women have trouble finding either jobs or local young men who might appear as suitable candidates for marriage. Many young women therefore pursue a range of different sorts of social and romantic relations with well-to-do older men, 
especially foreign men who visit the local hotels. Some of this involves activities that might be described as sex work. But there is always more to it than that. And there is often a hope, or indeed a plan, that a sexual liaison may become a relationship, and ultimately even a marriage. The statuses of prostitute, mistress, and wife are not discreet, and there is much movement from one to the other. The flows of resources that are accessed in this way do not only support individual women either. Young women's kin have their own ways of tapping into the income streams that enter the community via the women's intimate attachments. These young Malagasy people, whom Cole describes as seeking to support themselves via building intimate relationships, they themselves talk not of making a living, but of, in Cole's translation of a Malagasy phrase, making themselves living. This felicitous expression is a useful reminder that living in the jobless city is always bound up with the construction of persons and social relations. For the improvised livelihoods with which we are concerned do not simply replicate the form of the menial jobs of old, as if instead of clocking in at the factory, the worker now simply reports to the gates of the informal economy instead. Instead, such ways of making oneself living involve the whole person and comprise the whole of social life. The old industrial labor divisions of workplace versus home, on duty and off, labor and life, have no application here at all. And if this is true of finding lovers and patrons, it is also true of the perhaps more mainstream ways people find of making themselves living in the relationship-oriented livelihood practices that we call by names like petty retail and service work. Here, an ethnographic eye reveals that such work involves far more than simply a quantum of labor but instead entails the cultivation of relations of intimacy and sociality that, again, draw on the whole person and not only a capacity to labor for a certain number of hours. This suggests the need for more research that goes beyond exploring economically productive labor and the incomes it produces, and that grasps the more diverse and often distributive forms of livelihood that emerge out of the whole range of social life. Standard social science techniques, such as the household survey, for instance, valuable as they are, often exclude precisely those relational elements that are most important to enabling poor people to make themselves living. The centrality of relationships to what I have termed distributed livelihoods is nicely illustrated in another fine ethnographic account, Daniel Maines's insightful recent book called Hope is Cut, Youth, Unemployment, and the Future in Urban Ethiopia. There he finds, as one does in so many places in today's world, a widespread and intensely bitter dissatisfaction with the lack of formal sector employment. This dissatisfaction is combined with an acute nostalgia for a past era that is recalled as a time when it was possible to obtain proper jobs. In Ethiopia, this meant most of all government jobs, highly prized for their security and benefits. But Maines shows that even in those days, such employment was so highly valued, not just as a source of money, but because of the statuses and relationships it sustained. The high social status that was understood to come with the government job in particular rested on the fulfillment of a series of distributive obligations that linked the employed worker to a dense network of kin relations and followers who were attached to him. Today, Maines explains, the structure of employment has changed. So-called real jobs are vanishingly scarce, and it is precarious, low status, and very low-paid, so-called informal livelihoods that predominate, along with massive youth unemployment. 
But here, too, Maines demonstrates that relationships are central. Indeed, he shows that unemployment is actually a status within which young men are extremely active, actively working on the social relationships and gift practices that, in fact, sustain them. One whole section of the book is tellingly titled Accessing Material Wealth Through Unemployment. Making one's way in life here, it becomes clear, has little to do with productive labor in conventional terms, and a great deal to do with tending relationships, engaging in appropriate small reciprocities, sustaining one's social prestige and family connections, and a great many other practices that can be understood both as the activities appropriate to a properly social existence, and as forms of what I have called distributive labor. What I hope this very brief discussion of some recent anthropological work shows is the importance of an ethnographic approach in understanding both the improvised livelihoods of the jobless city and particularly the deep social relationships that I have suggested are fundamental to them. These cannot be understood only by looking at individuals or households and their incomes, as we so often do with survey research, nor are they much illuminated by developing formal occupational categorizations, which is a common artifact of trying to treat the so-called informal economy as if it were homologous with the formal one. Indeed, in cases such as the ones I have discussed here, the very idea of a discrete job, occupation, or enterprise may obscure more than it reveals. Instead, specific livelihood strategies unfold within dense networks of dependence and distribution, embedded in all the complex, subtle, and indirect ways in which poor people make themselves living. It is this whole social way of life, in my view, that is the proper analytical object of the sort of research we need if we are to understand the actually existing livelihoods of the jobless city. My second example, which will necessarily be even briefer, involves the question of how we might think about those state programs of cash transfer that I mentioned as a research problem. These programs have lately attracted a great deal of attention in development studies. And rightly so. I've suggested elsewhere that they are both demonstrably effective as anti-poverty policy and also at the heart of a vital new politics, a politics of distribution that has the potential to move beyond the techniques of poverty amelioration, narrowly understood, and to open up onto larger political questions, and perhaps ultimately also onto more far-reaching forms of political mobilization and political assertion. I've also suggested that rather than treat this as an ideological thesis to be debated, we approach it instead as an empirical set of issues to be researched. How, then, might we best approach the new politics of distribution as a research topic? To date, development studies has produced an admirable body of applied literature on programs of direct distribution in the context of state-run social protection schemes like those in Southern Africa, as well as a number of NGO-run interventions addressing such things as humanitarian assistance, post-war conflict resolution, and targeted poverty alleviation, all areas where cash transfers have been used and studied. In this respect, the new cash transfer programs are among the best studied anti-poverty policies we have ever had, with data coming from rigorous project evaluation studies, ambitious cross-regional comparisons, now even randomized controlled trials. These studies have given us strong evidence that even very small amounts of cash make a big difference in the quality of life of very poor people. More specifically, they provide real data on how increased access to cash affects measurable social goods like child nutrition, protection from high-risk sexual behaviors, access to social relations of reciprocity, and so on. <coughs> 
debunking the common fear that granting people even small amounts of money must produce a disincentive to labor, these studies show how such cash infusions, in fact, activate people rather than rendering them passive, enabling new forms of economic activity and energizing atrophied social networks. But there's something missing here. And it is the question that anthropologists tend to regard as among the most important of all. It is the question of meaning. What does it mean for someone to receive a cash transfer? What do such transfers signify to those who receive them? Considered not simply as a quantum of economic value, but as a social event, what is a transfer actually understood to be doing? It is not enough to ask how people spend it. What is the it in the first place? What exactly has the recipient of a social payment just received? On what grounds might one feel entitled to receive it? Or proud? Or ashamed? Or stigmatized? What does it mean to be receiving a transfer? The history of what we still call social assistance provides one set of answers to this question. Since social payments were in this tradition chiefly understood as a kind of supplement to the waged employment of the so-called real job. Children, mothers, the disabled, the elderly, these were the categories of legitimate dependents. A kind of photographic negative of the figure of the worker. These dependent categories legitimately received state support where they did, specifically because they were styled as weak or diminished, and therefore unable to care for themselves through labor. The able-bodied man was the contrasting figure, styled as autonomous and self-sufficient. A proper man in such a conception should be literally independent. <coughs> With a proper job, working for his daily bread, he would feel only shame at the prospect of receiving state assistance. In Give a Man a Fish, I explore an alternative conception, in which cash payments from the states to citizens are understood as having a fundamentally different meaning. Rather than assistance, charity, or help for the helpless, Certain state payments can be understood as instead comprising what I term a rightful share of a stock of wealth understood to be common. Residents of the U.S. state of Alaska, for instance, receive a substantial annual payment from the state, which is described as their share of the state's oil revenues. There is no shame involved in receiving such a payment, and it is not understood as the hated welfare. What one is receiving is simply one's own rightful share of something conceived as a common source of wealth. I have argued that a similar conception has been in play in recent campaigns in Namibia for a so-called basic income grant, where some have argued that such a grant is due to Namibian citizens precisely as a share, a share that is proper and rightful because the country's mineral wealth properly belongs to all Namibians. Such cases where direct distribution is imagined as a kind of rightful share due to citizens slash owners are important illustrations that there are in fact viable alternatives to the old social assistance vision of state payments as help for the helpless. But they are not the only such alternative, and myriad other possibilities wait to be explored. Some such alternative conceptions arose in my research in Namibia. Some Namibians, for instance, considered the worthy recipient of distribution to be not really a nation-state citizen, so much as a kind of kinsman in a national family linked, first of all, by a history of political struggle. Others were more likely to conceive of the legitimacy of the needs of a fellow human within an international fraternity of Christian humanist suffering and sharing. Or even, to take the most expansive conception I discovered, to suggest that a distributive claim might be grounded in presence itself, so that it is simply, as one woman put it, 
those who are here who command the most fundamental sort of obligations from the state. But all of this is only to scratch the surface. Once we have acknowledged that the contemporary meaning of cash transfers exceeds and overflows the old understanding of social assistance or help for the helpless, there emerges a huge field of social practice and social meaning that we've hardly begun to explore. And if I'm right that we're entering a period in which more and more people must seek their livelihoods not by exchanging productive labor, but by making distributive claims, including claims to direct distribution from the state, then there is a special urgency to seeking to understand the social and political significance of such claims. Seeking answers to these sorts of questions, I think, should be at the heart of development studies' contribution to the question of cash transfers in particular, and of the politics of distribution in general. This is so even in the most narrow terms of program evaluation, where questions of household expenditures and caloric consumption need to be supplemented with attention both to vernacular understandings of state transfers and to how such distributive flows articulate with the wider distributive economies I discussed earlier. But beyond the logic of the project evaluation, such a research agenda might also lead us to new understandings of the sorts of political demands and mobilizations that might be associated with such direct forms of distribution in the future. If so, the sort of empirical research I'm advocating might help us to find our way, not just to better programs for ameliorating poverty, but also to beginning to imagine new horizons for a radical but realistic politics of the new urban masses of the jobless city. Let me conclude. We are only beginning the intellectual reorientation we will need to make good sense of the world of the not working. I have argued here that a key element of that reorientation must be methodological. To understand worlds where livelihoods can less and less be conceived as market exchanges of labor, and where people instead make themselves living via socially embedded processes of distribution, we will need to know much more about meanings and relationships. As I've suggested, ethnography can play a valuable role here. I am not naive about the difficulties we face here. Ethnography as a research method is long, slow, very demanding, and sometimes difficult to explain and to legitimate in institutional settings where so-called real data is often assumed to come in numerical form. It is also notoriously difficult to integrate into the project-oriented timeframes and institutional imperatives of practical development work. But I hope to have shown that there is a real payoff in persevering through these difficulties, insofar as ethnographic approaches give unique insights into the relational worlds and meaningful practices that sustain improvised distributive livelihoods. And we will all benefit, I think, if we can manage to build the intellectual and professional bridges that will allow these insights to better travel into a broader range of institutional and political sites, sites where they might make a real difference.